know, I'd like to welcome everyone today uh, to our Are You Ready to Garden series, episode five. Um, we air every Thursday evening at 6.30. And uh, we'd like you to tell your friends and neighbors about joining us each week for some great gardening tips from Rutgers Cooperative Extension. Our team brings together experts from Rutgers University and the New Jersey Ag Experiment Station, as well as farmers that are experts in our area and others that we know that are willing to share their expertise with all of us. Uh, I'm your host, Bill Lubick, um, from Rutgers Cooperative Extension in Middlesex County. I'm the Ag Agent for RCA, a professor at Rutgers. I teach uh, sustainable agriculture and starting a small farm courses at Rutgers. So without further ado, let me introduce uh, Angela Monahan, who we are very fortunate to have on our team. Angela uh, has a BS in plant science from Rutgers University and a certificate in medicinal plants. Uh, she became uh, passionate about plants while working on a nursery in South Jersey and where she learned the importance of native plants and how to encourage pollinators and, and beneficial wildlife. Uh, we're very fortunate to actually have her on our team here. And um, without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Angela Monahan to talk about creating a pollinator's paradise in your yard. Angela. So a little bit of an overview. Uh, we're going to talk about um, what pollinators are and talk about some other beneficial. Uh, we'll also define what native is versus invasive and also alien species. We're also going to be discussing why we plant for wildlife and steps to create a pollinator's paradise. All right, so what is a pollinator? Great question. Insects and animals that uh, assist in the transfer of pollen between plants, as simple as it gets, um, it helps ensure the fertilization and continuation of the plant species by cross-pollinating, uh, by going from flower to flower and introducing different genetics to these different um, plant species. So um, genetic variety is really helpful um, to ensure the viability of, um, of native plant species. Um, okay, so, um, so like I said, cross-fertilization uh, cross uh, increases the genetic variety in plant species, and that way uh, we're, able, uh, we're able to see genetic diversity and um, different plant species uh, become more viable and uh, sustainable since they um, have different genetics, they will also um, have a better capacity to be pest and disease resistant. So just some mentions uh, about different pollinators. Um, a lot of us know that bees are very important pollinators. Uh, we also have butterflies, um, very common and popular pollinator. Uh, we also have wasps, moths, uh, beetles, such as ladybird beetle. Flies can be pollinators as well as birds, such as hummingbirds. That's an interesting pollinator. Um, they actually pollinate a lot of plants, um, uh, a lot of cactus plants in the southeast. Uh, wind can be a pollinator. That's more of an abiotic pollinator. And also humans are pollinators. So um, all, most of all plants depend on insects for pollination. Um, some trees and uh, other species uh, depend on wind for pollination, but a lot of uh, Plants depend on insects for pollination. And in turn, birds depend on insects to feed their young and um, help them to grow uh, and giving them protein by insects. Um, so we see here on the left uh, the monarch butterfly feeding on a tithonia plant. Uh, tithonia is a great uh, late season pollinator. Uh, it's, very, it's great for monarchs as they migrate south. And um, to the right, you see a hummingbird feeding on a Monarda species. Uh, hummingbirds have a long tubular beak, and oh, thank you. Um, and their beak helps um, to get to the the nectar in those long red tubular uh, flowers. So, um, if you have flowers that are tubular, um, such as the Monarda, also um, another species we'll see later um, is the coral honeysuckle. Um, Hummingbirds will be very interested in those plants. If you have those in your garden, you will see an increase in hummingbirds in your yard. Uh, here is a picture of the honeybee, Apis mellifera. Um, there's been a lot of discussion about colony collapse disorder and how um, different factors are affecting the honeybee, but this is not the only guy in town. There are over, um, over 4,000 species 
species of native yeast in the U.S. alone, and 300 in New Jersey. So um, bees aren't the only pollinators of crops around the world. Um, we have a lot of native bees that do pollinate crops, um, and animals in general pollinate over 85% of plant species. So bees in particular are really great pollinators, um, and so we want to encourage bees um, in our gardens to help pollinate our vegetable plants. So let's talk about some other types of beneficial insects. Um, one would be predators. Uh, as you see here, we have the ladybird beetle feeding on an aphid. Um, we love this ladybird beetle for that. Uh, aphids are a scourge to a lot of our uh, vegetable pests and uh, ornamentals as well. So what predators do, um, they're usually adult insects. They can be spiders as well. Uh, they are going to hunt for other insects for food. Um, and so that's the protein source. But like any animal um, or any um, living organism, you need a variety of um, different types of food in order to, um, in order to live. So um, predators will also feed on pollen as well. Um, predators lay in wait on flower foliage to ambush their prey. And some even use toxins uh, in their saliva to paralyze prey. Or they can inject digestive fluids into their prey, which is kind of crazy, but very interesting. Um, they can also use camouflage. Um, they can kind of change their body colors um, to match their flowers, uh, the flowers that they're hiding on, uh, in order to hide from their prey. Another type of beneficial insect is a parasitoid. Um, what they do, instead of attacking their prey directly, they actually lay eggs on the host or near the host nest. Um, and then when the eggs hatch, the larva feeds on the host and eventually killing the, the host. Um, parasitoid beetles, for instance, hop on wasps. Um, a parasitoid beetle will uh, lay in wait on a flower until a wasp comes, and it will ride on the back of the wasp um, back to the wasp's nest to feed on the host larva. Um, some parasitoids will even lay eggs on the host while in flight, like uh, tachinid flies. Here's some more pictures of beneficial insects. Um, top left, we see um, a parasitoid wasp. And at the bottom is a tomato hornworm. So this is the prey of the parasitic wasp. And those funny little white um, lines that you see on the back of the caterpillar are actually the egg sacs of the parasitic wasp. So what will happen, if you see this in your garden, um, you let the tomato hornworm go. Uh, usually tomato hornworm defoliates tomato plants, so it's, it's tempting to remove that tomato hornworm, but if you see these egg sacs on the hornworm's back, what's going to happen is once those egg sacs um, uh, emerge, um, they'll start feeding on the tomato hornworm, eventually killing it, but then it'll also create more parasitic wasps, so um, that'll proliferate in your garden. Um, top right is lacewing. Uh, lace wings, uh, they like to eat aphids as well. And um, on the bottom right, you see the wheel bug. It's a type of assassin bug. And um, they can bite humans. So if you see one, uh, don't try to handle it. Just kind of admire it from afar. Andrew, we have a question. Oh, yeah, sure. Go ahead. One of the questions is, does any uh, bee bomb plant work, or does it have to be a specific variety or natives? Um, so I'll talk about different, um, like, nativars and stuff in a little bit. But um, hummingbirds specifically like uh, red and orange um, flowers, and they like that tubular shape. So the Monarda didyma is the red, and the Monarda fistulosa is the purple. Um, so they might feed on the purple variety, but um, the hummingbirds are very attracted to the red. Um, that color is um, very attractive to them. So um, if you do want to attract hummingbirds, I would go with the, um, the red variety. Anything else for now? All right. Um, that was it. Thanks, Angela. All right. Thanks, Bill. So over millions of years, um, plants and uh, different animals have co-evolved. Um, these insects have evolved alongside native plants, um, and 
depend on them for either um, food or shelter. And some insects specialize and recognize certain plant species as food. So uh, for example, uh, on the left-hand side, we see a monarch caterpillar eating swamp milkweed. Now, um, swamp milkweed is a host plant for, um, for monarch caterpillars. And what that means is that a host plant is um, a plant that will um, provide uh, a food source, a very important food source for the caterpillar. Um, what happens is uh, the milkweed plant is actually toxic. Um, it exudes this milky latex. And once the caterpillar eats this, it'll become poisonous to birds. So it's a defense mechanism. And um, the, what happens is the monarch butterfly will, um, will come and lay its eggs, usually on the underside of the leaves. And, um, and then once those eggs hatch, the caterpillars emerge and start feeding on the plant. Um, now you may be wondering, well, if the caterpillar eats the leaves of this plant, is that gonna hurt the plant? Well, no. So since, um, since the caterpillar and the monarch, uh, I'm sorry, since the caterpillar and the milkweed have co-evolved for millions, of, or I mean, not millions of years, but for years, um, they, uh, it's, it's okay. Um, it, the plant ends up storing enough nutrients in the roots over the summer before the caterpillars can, um, can eat the plant. And um, uh, milkweeds are usually perennials, so um, they'll store all those nutrients in the roots and reemerge the next year. Um, milkweeds don't look so great towards the end of the summer because a lot of them are very defoliated, um, but they do have attractive seed pods, and um, I, I think that's an attractive feature in the garden. Just um, if you don't want a lot of milkweed in your garden, you might want to snip those milk pot or those seed pods out so that um, you don't have milkweed everywhere in your yard. So um, insect species provide food. Um, also for, for birds and other insects as well. And so there's uh, this food web um, that's complex and um, we have different, uh, different animals and insects relying on each other. So without insects, um, you know, our entire food web would collapse. We need insects for pollination for, for our food as well as other, um, other animals need um, insects for their food. So um, I don't know how you guys feel about spiders. I don't mind them so much, but they're a very important factor uh, in our food web as well. Um, here you, you see um, the spiders, and uh, we have two pictures on the right-hand side, um, both of an agastache plant, uh, which has really great strong stems, and um, some insects um, and uh, spiders rely on those strong stems to hold their chrysalis, as in the monarch butterfly picture here in the center. And the spiders will also create their webs on those strong stems of the agastache. All right, so let's define native. Um, simply put, uh, they're plants living on this continent before European settlers arrived. Um, there's some debate as to whether some plants are native and not, but um, for all intents and purposes, this is um, the definition we're sticking with. So there's also uh, straight species of natives versus cultivated varieties, which um, is, are called cultivars. So a native plus cultivar, um, we have this slang term called nativar. So that's a cultivated variety of native plants. Plants can vary in leaf color and, uh, I'm sorry, leaf, leaf shape and flower color. Yeah, also leaf color as well. Um, different sizes, disease resistance, um, as you can see here in this uh, echinacea or uh, coneflower plant. So um, we have different, uh, different cultivars here. Um, you have this white variety on top right, um, and then another variety um, that has double flowers on the bottom left. So there's this huge debate out there. Are natives better than nativars? Um, that's, that's a great question. So um, some native uh, some straight natives are better, they can be, because when you're breeding plants, um, sometimes if you're breeding for a specific characteristic, you can breed out different uh, characteristics that insects may like. So that could be a bad thing, because if, um, if there's a specific protein or a molecule that, um, that insects need in order to survive, 
and that's bred out during the breeding process because the breeder maybe wanted to um, have a different flower color, say, um, that, could, that could be detrimental to um, insect pollination. All right. And then, um, like I said, there's pros and cons. Um, they may differ in volatile chemicals. Um, it would be really hard for um, a bee, say, to try to use this um, double bloom flower on the bottom left as um, to try to get into the pollen um, or the nectar of the plant. So um, the bottom left is not a very good variety to use for, um, for pollinators. Um, that's ornamentally very aesthetically pleasing. Um, so there are, there are some pros and cons out there. Um, I'm kind of a sucker for nativars. Um, I think some species are very attractive and um, or some cultivars are very attractive. Um, but what I like to say is that, um, you know, you do want to provide those straight species of native plants um, in order to give your, um, give your insects and your pollinators um, a lot of those nutrients that they need. And if you have a couple of nativars here and there in your landscape, I don't think that's a big deal. So um, uh, like the Baptisia, um, they, uh, they have a lot of really cool different colored um, nativars. Um, so sometimes also there's more nectar and then sometimes less. So um, a really cool project by Mount Cuba Center. Um, they're located in Delaware. They, um, they're a native plant, um, uh, a native plant botanical garden, and they do a lot of research. Uh, they have a trial garden where they evaluate different plants. Um, like I said, they had the Baptisia trial where they trialed out all the different flowers, um, all the different nat nativars of the different colors, and um, they trial to see how many insects come and visit each cultivar. And um, I think that's really important because they are able to see which nativars are beneficial versus which aren't. So um, if you're interested in seeing which, um, or, or, sorry, which species they've um, evaluated, um, I would definitely check out the Mount Cuba Center website. Um, unfortunately, they're closed right now, um, but hopefully they'll reopen soon. And um, in the meantime, they also have some really great educational um, educational programs online. All right, so um, native, native species versus exotic and alien species. So when we talk about exotic or alien species, that just means they're not from the United States, um, they're from a different area. So these can be insects, animals, birds, and plants. Um, not all alien species are bad, um, such as zinnias. Uh, they're not native, but they also provide pollen for different pollinators but not all natives are better. So there's kind of a misnomer out there where people call um, native plants invasive. Um, and I think there needs to be a distinction there. Um, some native plants can be very aggressive, um, such as Virginia creeper. Um, I know that's all over the back corner of my yard right now. Um, and also poison ivy, which I have all over the of my yard. Um, and they're both native plants, but um, they're fine. So they have a, a very fast growing habit and grow over everything, um, but they're not invasive because they come from the, the United States and um, they're just very aggressive. And, um, you know, in, in other cases, uh, they can be poisonous. Um, so let's define invasive. Um, the official U.S. government definition of invasive uh, it means it's an alien species whose introduction does or is likely to cause economic or environmental harm or harm to human health. Um, so in another, put another way, um, any sort of plant, insect, or animal species that has been introduced here and which are or can become out of balance with, with our native ecosystem. Um, this can be destructive and detrimental. Um, we see this with a lot of invasive uh, insects. Um, right now, there is the... Um, uh, a fly, which um, can can uh, be destructive to a lot of our apple and grape crops, um, and then there's other plant species like Japanese knotweed, which can take over um, wild, which can take over um, edges of woodlands and outcompete with native plants. So that's why invasive species aren't very good. They they outcompete our native species and um, leaves little habitat for our native plants and animals. So here are some examples of invasive plant species. Um, bamboo, 
hate it. Inch Ivy, hate it. It's all over my backyard. I've been trying to get rid of it. Um, and Bradford Dare, which is a terrible springtime tree. I know it planted in a lot of people's development. Um, it has a pretty white flower in spring, but, um, but for one, um, it's a pear, and pears have narrow crotch angles, and that makes it really susceptible to storm damage. So if you have a heavy snow load or a lot of wind, which happens in New Jersey, um, you'll see a lot of these branches fall, and that will um, that will open the plant up for disease. And um, so they make people um, have allergies very bad at that time of the year. So um, I would not plant uh, Bradford pear. Instead, maybe something like um, amelanchia, which is a uh, shad bush. Um, that would be a good alternative. Um, it's a white flowering tree, and um, it would be an alternative to the Bradford pear. And uh, Michelle might be talking about um, some other um, uh, native plants that you can plant instead of some of these invasives on Monday. All right, so why do we plant natives? Um, they're better adapted to our, our ecosystem. Uh, they can be less maintenance. You don't really need to fertilize them. Uh, they encourage wildlife, and a lot of times they're drought tolerant. Um, they're, they're acclimated to our area. So um, they, um, they can be, um, you know, depending on the soil type, if they're planted in the right place, um, they, can, they can withstand a lot of um, uh, environmental change. All right, so let's talk about how to pollinate pollinators, um, so gardening for wildlife. Uh, Bill, do, are there any questions? Before yes, there's, there's, one, there's one question here. Um, how does an invasive plant uh, attract insects that are harmful if those insects aren't native to the land. So, so how does how does a, a, an invasive plant attract native pests? Yes, if those insects aren't native to the land. So, I'll let you answer that unless you want me to go ahead. Um, well, I guess in the case of spotted uh, lanternfly tree of heaven, um, those are from Asia and um, tree of heaven or Elianthus um, is uh, a tree that has um, kind of taken over the landscape. You'll see it a lot on the roadways, um, and um, that the tree of heaven is actually a host plant. Um, so it uh, for the um, spotted lanternfly. So spotted lanternfly needs um, the, uh, the host plant, which is the Elianthus, to complete its life cycle. And so, um, so that, that, and they're both invasive, so they would need, so that um, uh, the spotted lanternfly does need um, tree of heaven or something like that to complete its life cycle. So that's how that would be attractive. If you're familiar with that um, biologically, and um, they're able to, um, I guess, with pheromones that are all chemicals, they're able to um, disseminate that to the, the plant that they need to. Um, Help proliferate. Bill, do you have any um, anything you want to add to that, or Rich? Yeah, I would just add that um, certain plants, um, because they uh, many of our plants now are introduced throughout the world, uh, some insects can adapt uh, to the plants that we distribute, and so even some of those invasive species that come in to our area. Can, can then uh, are already uh, predisposed or adapted to those plants. So it can be part of uh, their life cycle. It depends on the specific insect and the specific plant, um, but there is adaptation that occurs and changes that occur uh, within insects uh, over the course of coevolution. Great, thank you, Bill. Um, so yeah, let's talk a little bit more about how to attract pollinators to your landscape. Um, this was adapted by my native plant guru, Christine Clemson, of Clemson Farms, where, where I worked um, as an intern a few years ago. So, so um, one, uh, I want to choose a sunny location. Uh, a lot of insects are cold-blooded, so they need the sun to warm up and warm their body parts. Uh, give me shelter. Uh, they need shelter and other um, spaces in which to predators. Uh, seasonal bloom, 
Mm-hmm. We can talk about um, a wide variety of offering a wide variety of uh, plant times for plants, um, plant in masses, so planting in groups, um, also planting native ecotypes. We'll talk about what an ecotype is in a little bit. Host within this, providing host plants for different, um, for different pollinators, uh, providing water sources and a fruit source, um, also planting grasses, encouraging native bee habitats, spring cleaning, and just say no to pesticides. Um, before, um, I guess part of um, choosing a sunny location, I guess choosing a location in general, um, you really want to test your soil so you know what you're starting off with. Um, this uh, soil test determines your characteristics. Um, you also want to figure out what type of soil you have, whether it's sandy or clay or loam, because uh, knowing the composition of your soil really helps determine which plants are going to be able to grow successfully in your yard. Um, you'll also find out what your pH balance is by your soil test, um, whether it's very acidic or more um, um, <laughs> uh, acidic or um, neutral, or um, whether it's more alkaline. Uh, also, you want to know your nutrient levels. And um, compost cover crops in multiple cancer soil. And I also want to give a plug to the Rutgers Soil Testing Lab, which opened back up recently after a little hiatus. Um, you can go to their website. If you just uh, type in your search engine, uh, Rutgers Soil Testing Lab, you'll be able to view the website. They have a really great video on uh, demonstrating how to test your soil, and um, you'll be able to print out a form about your, with your soil test and send in, um, send in your soil, te uh, soil sample um, to have your uh, sample tested. So to prepare your site, um, there's some things that you want to do before you start planting. If you're starting fresh, uh, um, you could either uh, remove all the sod, um, which is your turf grass. Um, you also want to re remove any invasive species. And then you can do this by tilling the soil, um, the rototiller, or you can play, uh, lay down newspaper or cardboard with mulch on top to kill your sod. So whatever method you choose, um, this will work. Uh, you also want to add some organic um, organic matter, like compost, um, on top of the existing soil. So um, you want to make sure that um, you're getting uh, really good local fresh compost, um, making sure it's certified compost or uh, topsoil, um, because you don't want any um, invasive of seeds or any bad microbes to be introduced into your garden. All right, so give me shelter. So um, this is my back corner of my yard. Um, I have a little brush pile going back here. Birds love it. Um, also note my, uh, my poison ivy and um, Virginia creeper. Um, this is a little grove of uh, sassafras trees that have just grown here naturally. And um, it's a great little spot for the wildlife because they hide in there. Um, kind of, it can be a nesting site. A lot of birds can take um, this brush and uh, fly away with it. So, a little corner of your yard that you don't mind, kind of a messy spot, um, it would be really beneficial because, um, like I said, beneficial insects need places to hide from predators. Um, they can nest in these places and overwinter. And um, you also, when, when cleaning out your gardens in the fall, um, that's really good for your vegetable gardens, but you actually don't want to clean out your perennial beds uh, in the fall because a lot of your beneficial insects overwinter in, um, in hollow stems, in grasses, et cetera. So you want to wait until around um, mid-March, you know, sometime in the early spring um, to clean up a lot of those um, a lot of those uh, stems and, um, and grasses and such. Um, you could also incorporate some dead logs or rock pile into your little landscape if you don't like the look of brush. And, um, and those would also be great sites for overwintering and beneficial effects. So let's talk a little bit about plant selection. Um, when you're thinking about your garden, um, whether you have an existing garden or whether you're starting a new garden, you really want to design the garden first and really think about 
how how plants are going to kind of interact with each other in the landscape. So knowing about the plant height and the width of the window because you do a proper spacing and airflow between them. Um, and with plant height, you don't want to plant a butterfly weed, which maybe grows two to three feet tall, um, behind some of your native grasses like little blue stem. Little blue stem can be, you know, four or five feet tall. And if you plant the grass in front of um, your butterfly weed, then you're going to be hiding the butterfly weed and it's not going to be as pronounced in your garden. Um, as we said before, um, you really want to make sure that you know your soil type in your garden and the moisture level. Um, I have really sandy, dry soil where I am, uh, but other places in North Jersey will have more of a clay soil. So it's really important to know what the soil you have and what the moisture level is like before choosing and selecting plants. Um, Bill, anything? Yes, we have a question. Uh, where are places to view and learn about native plants and ecosystems? Um, I have some resources at the end that I think might answer that question. So if you want to hold on a little bit, we can uh, Sounds good. Thank you. All righty. Uh, so also um, observing where sun, how the sun expose, is exposed in your yard. Um, if you have full sun, part shade, or full shade, um, there, are, there are all sorts of different plants that, that um, will uh, will grow great in, in, in any location. So really knowing um, your sun exposure will really help. Because if you have, um, you know, a lot of evergreens really need full sun. Um, you know, some like hemlock, like a full shade, um, but a lot of evergreens do like that full sun. So by planting um, your evergreens in a shady location, you might not have as uh, great success with your native plants if you plant them in the wrong location. And then when you go to buy plants um, from a nursery, um, you really want to make sure that the plant's healthy. Um, so by taking the plant out of the pot, looking at its roots, if you want like nice light brown to tan colored roots. Um, if you see uh, black fruit in, your, in the pot, um, that's uh, root rot, and you want to be wary of that. Um, roots are a very important part of the plant. That's where the plant takes up a lot of the water and nutrients. So by having a healthy root system, um, you're ensuring uh, success in your plants. And then you also want to look for any insects in your plants when selecting them at the nursery. Um, if you see that there's any, uh, any sort of insects or chewing marks, or any sort of um, like spots on your plant, um, try to choose a different plant. Um, and that way you're ensuring the health of your plant in the long run. And you're, not, you're also not introducing insects or disease into your garden. No? Yeah, there's a, a question here on um, what, what is the best way to get rid of poison ivy? And um, <laughs> I've been dealing a lot with that in my sister's yard. So do you want me to tackle that one? Um, yeah, go for it. Okay. So poison ivy um, in some landscapes, once it gets established, it is very difficult to get a handle on it. Um, and even with uh, non-selective herbicides that are out there, uh, it requires multiple applications. One of the things that I found very successful um, is uh, if you don't have somebody else that can remove it, especially if you're very sensitive to poison ivy, I probably would not recommend that you try to do this, uh, but have somebody who's either less sensitive or who's a certified um, pest applicator. The other thing you can do is cut it off at the very base. Poison ivy does not like to be mowed low to the ground. So if it's growing up in a tree or through a shrub, basically cut its lifeline to the, the soil and just keep that pruned consistently. And that's how I've been able to reduce poison ivy in a couple of yards that um, I've helped people out with from, you know, a major uh, infestation of poison ivy to now we've pretty much eliminated the poison ivy. So cutting it continually at the base uh, and then letting it die. And then once, you know, if you got to wear gloves and be really careful removing it because even poison ivy, uh, after it's dead, it still has the oils in it that can uh, cause a reaction to your skin. So you got to be very careful. Okay. Thanks, Bill. Yeah, I'm going to try uh, with the poison ivy in my yard. It's kind of along the fence line, and part of it is hard to mow. Um, I'm going to try putting um, some boxes down and suppressing it, and then putting mulch on top. Um, and then 
then eventually planting in those spaces. Um, so I'll let you guys know how that works. It'll be an experiment. Um, but yeah, that's, I think you know, you're right in cutting it back and cutting off that lifeline to the plant um, will be really beneficial. All right, so uh, seasonal blooms. Um, so we want to think about um, plants that bloom all season from spring until fall. Um, a lot of times uh, we'll, think of, we'll think of plants that grow really early in the spring, and then you might have some lag time, and then that bloom just in the summer, and then that's it. Um, there's a lot of really great plants that are blooming right now, like this coral honeysuckle that you see pictured here. Um, there's also, I'll show you some more pictures in a little bit, um, but a lot of plants, you know, bloom at different time periods, and I'll show you some resources where you can see um, when plants bloom at certain times. So you want a nice continuous bloom um, in your garden throughout the season, and in the fall is very important for a lot of your migratory species like monarchs. Um, providing nectar sources for monarchs is especially important um, as they make their way south. Um, so also you want to think about flower color. A lot of butterflies are attracted to your reds, yellows, orange, pinks, and purples. Um, whereas these like the cooler colors, um, like your blues, your purples, violets, whites, and yellow. Um, and like we were kind of talking about before, thinking about flower shape. Um, flat tops for butterflies, which have short tubes, um, are really great. So thinking about, um, you know, your carrot family plants, um, your composite uh, or your aster family plants, they have short tubes and a lot of times they'll have flat tops or flower clusters. And um, like we talked about before, like with the coral honeysuckle, it has that tubular uh, flower. So that's great for, um, for hummingbirds. Um, so kind of mix it up when you're thinking about different plants to plant. Um, in your landscape, thinking about different flower shapes and colors. Um, and you also, um, you don't necessarily just want to put all herbaceous plants, um, but you also want to think about trees and shrubs, vines and grasses. Um, grasses are really important for birds to hide uh, from predators. And, and um, trees like oak find a lot of food uh, sources for birds, um, squirrels, as well as um, insects. Um, oak's actually a really great species. Um, if you are, have you a big enough space in your landscape, um, providing oak um, to different insects um, is a great source of food for them. All right, so um, more about seasonal blooms. Um, you also want to think about bloom time, like I said, creating those three seasons of interest. Um, but you also want to create winter interest. Um, here is a picture of uh, a holly. It's, um, it's an evergreen holly that produces these little berries. Um, I actually just got these plants recently, and they've been pruned pretty severely to encourage more bushiness. Um, so they don't look 100% great right now. But if you have boxwood and you're, um, and you're concerned about boxwood blight, um, these are a really great alternative. Uh, there are some cultivars um, like Gembox that have a nice um, small rounded shape. Um, the straight native of the inkberry holly can get rather large, so if you need a smaller uh, cultivar in your landscape, I would look at some of the smaller varieties. Um, but it's a really great evergreen. Um, it provides fruit for uh, birds, and uh, it has a little tiny flower that, um, that comes on in June. It's a white flower, kind of inconspicuous, but, um, but they're really great. They can make a great hedge, uh, which I plan to do um, along my neighbor's fence. Um, and you also want to think about plant texture. Um, plant leaves have all different shapes and sizes, and the flowers have all different shapes and sizes. So thinking about um, not just the flower, but the actual leaf and how that can be attractive. So a lot of times we think of, oh, flowers, um, you know, we love that color, we love the shape, but leaf texture can also be really interesting. Here are some pictures of some flowers that are blooming right now. Um, these are taken at the Earth Center. Um, so uh, to the left, we have Baptisia. This is false indigo. Um, I like their, the, the flower is uh, a P-shape. Um, it's a nitrogen fixer. And the leaves are nice and kind of rounded. Um, it has these really cool spikes that the flowers are born on. And um, it's nice. Uh, it, it gets to be like 
five feet of the spikes. And once those flowers um, finish blooming, they have a really cool seed pod that persists through the fall and the winter that I find really attractive. Um, and next we have is a, a Amsonia. Uh, this is a broadleaf Amsonia. There's also a thinner leaf Amsonia. And I really like this plant because I think it's interesting um, for three seasons. So here in the spring, um, it has this blue star flower, um, blue flower in little clusters. Um, I, I kind of like the, the thinner leaf a little bit better. It kind of has more like uh, ethereal look to it. Um, in the summer, you can see the seed pod. Seed pod's pretty cool. It's a long, thin seed pod. And then in the fall, it has beautiful fall leaf color. It's like this bright orangey yellow, and um, it just looks really attractive. So thinking about um, plants having more than one season of interest. Um, so to the right, you see bleeding heart, which is a really cool flower, but it's the bleeding heart plant is kind of a spring ephemeral, meaning it dies back in the like after it's done blooming in the summer and so um it's a really cool plant in the spring um but you don't really see a lot of it um, after it blooms bill anything yes um somebody was asking about getting rid of pokeweed and another person asked uh they said is pokeweed a native of which it is uh, to north america you want to talk about that a little bit um sure i mean uh, depending on where it's growing, yes, pokeweed is a native. Um, if, you, if, you, if it's in a, a weird place in your yard, um, you might want to remove it. The thing is, it has a very long tap root, so um, you're going to have to dig that out, um, or otherwise it will come back. Um, you know, it, it gets very tall, it can be like six, eight feet tall, um, and birds do love the fruit. Um, it is poisonous to humans. So um, we don't want to eat the fruit. Um, I've heard that when the leaves are very young, you can eat the leaves, but I would kind of suggest against it because, um, you know, it's poisonous at all other times. Um, but, I mean, it's kind of in, a, in an area that you don't mind. Just let it go and let the birds eat the fruit. The, um, just, just to comment on that, um, a, a couple things. that Pokeweed is poisonous to people, to dogs to livestock so we actually uh, in many of our pastures where we have animals um, we really do get rid of we, we make an effort to get rid of pokeweed and you really wouldn't want to eat the leaves because there are toxins in it that you wouldn't want to accumulate in your system so uh, I would advise against that uh, getting rid of it is just being consistent to continually removing it um, and that's what we do on the farm. You know, we, if we see it even starting to grow as a small plant, uh, we remove it because it can be problematic for animals and people. And we also have somebody who mentioned the fact that they kept trying to dig it out, but they still have an issue. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty persistent. So, yeah. So yeah, being persistent about trying to get it, get it out, the roots out, but also just keep trimming it off uh, over time. All right. So, all right. Um, so let's talk a little bit about plants for uh, other beneficial insects, um, like the predatory uh, predators or the parasitoids. Um, you'll see um, the plants um, mentioned in white with asterisks are native plants, um, but some other um, alien or exotic plants, which we use, which are very common in our gardens, like sage and rosemary, um, they can be great. The flowers can be great for beneficial insects, and they're not invasive. Um, humans use them, and um, you know they're good for culinary um, as a culinary choice. Um, but also plants that are in the carrot family, um, like parsley and dill. Um, we also have zizia, which are called golden alexanders. You can see that um, bottom right here. Um, that's in the parsley family. It's a great uh, for beneficial insects, and it's native. And then also um, the uringium yuccifolium, which is uh, commonly called rattlesnake master, is a really great plant for beneficial insects. Um, some generally plants in the composite or aster family, 
like your sunflowers, goldenrods, New England aster, um, your liatris, and your echinacea um, are great for pollinators. And then um, anything in the milkweed family, like your swamp milkweed, common milkweed, or butterfly weed, um, are all really good pollinators. So generally speaking, um, those those plant families are great for pollinators. There's other plant families that um, are good plants for pollinators as well. So um, generally speaking, if you stick to these, um, you'll definitely uh, see a lot more pollinators in your landscape. All right, um, we also want to think about planting in mass. Um, by planting in mass you're, and grouping plants um, in clumps, you're going to be attracting more pollinators. You're giving them more of a, um, an opportunity for your, their nectar or pollen source um, because there's more of it. Um, and then also aesthetically it's pleasing uh, because you're seeing groups of plants and not just a single plant here, another species of a single plant there. Um, you're kind of creating, you're, you're, make, you're letting the eye kind of move through the garden. Um, and then also planting in odd numbers, like in threes or fives, um, is very aesthetically pleasing. And um, you're creating more of an impact when you plant in mass. All right, so let's uh, talk about native ecotypes. So um, an ecotype is a plant uh, that um, is native to a specific region. Um, they can differ in characteristics. Um, some of those characteristics include plant height, its growth habits, and its maturation date, leaf appearance, and reproductive habits. So um, this is a goldenrod. A goldenrod that is planted in um, by the beach uh, might mature a little bit later than a plant that's planted inland because of, um, you know, because of the temperatures um, and, and whatnot. And so um, those, those would be your ecotypes. So another ecotype would be by state or, um, you know, region, um, south versus north. You can get variation um, in different plants of the same species um, that live in the south versus plants that live in the north. So trying to... Um, Trying to find plants that are native to your ecotype will um, also uh, help in your garden to keep that going. Um, so, public service announcement from your local cooperative extension please, please, please never source plants from the wild. Just do not go into the woods and dig up native plants, um, and they'll likely die as taken from their environment. And then also, you're taking away that, that plant um, from the, the beneficial insects that rely on that plant and you're diminishing the population. Um, you're gonna have a dead, plant, a dead plant in your landscape and then you know, another plant that's disappeared from the wild. Um, but what you can do is um, select your plants from a reputable nursery. You're also supporting farmers. And um, if you go to the Native Plant um, Society of New Jersey, they have a great list of native plant nurseries in, in New Jersey that um, you can purchase native plants from. All right, so um, let's talk about host plants. Like we talked about earlier, a host plant is a plant that an insect, an insect relies on um, to complete its life cycle. So um, a lot of times they serve as food for the larval stage of caterpillars. Um, on the left-hand side here, you see a swallowtail caterpillar that's feeding on a parsley plant. Um, and then to the right, like we kind of talked about before, uh, the monarch caterpillar on milkweed. Um, I have a little story about one time when I was first starting to garden, I was building an herb bed and I had some parsley and I noticed that a lot of my parsley plant um, had gone missing. And so I saw these little caterpillars and um, I got real mad and I didn't do any research as to what they were, um, but I, you know, it was all about like, oh, I want to be organic. And so I used um, BT, which is Bactylus thuringiensis, and um, I sprayed my parsley plants. And problem solved, caterpillars were gone. Uh, later I realized that I had sprayed and essentially poisoned um, a bunch of swallowtail butterfly caterpillars, and I felt really bad about it. So just because um, a pesticide is organic doesn't mean it won't have an effect on a lot of our, our uh, flora and fauna. Um, you know, organic pesticides can be just as impactful 
Um, and so you want to make sure that when you see, uh, when you're monitoring your garden, that you are identifying what the problem is and that you know for sure what the problem is before you um, go and attack it head on. So um, just make sure that um, you know you're not uh, hurting yeah, your wildlife in your garden um, because wildlife are beautiful and um, you want to make sure that they're um, being propagated. So uh, we also want to consider pollen and nectar plants. So not just perennials, but some annuals. Like um, on the right-hand corner, we have that jasonia. That's an annual. Um, and then, again, we have some milkweed, uh, which is a perennial. So providing nectar sources for your butterflies, your bees, and the other um, beneficial insects. All right, so um, I like to call this garden accessories. So, um, you know, plants are really important, but there's also other resources that pollinators need in order to, um, in order to live. Just like we need water, um, bees and butterflies um, need hydrate as well. Um, so you can create um, sort of puddles for, um, for your pollinators, uh, some wet sand with some rocks, um, the, the, uh, some of the pollinators can use their mouth parts to suck up water and nutrients from uh, the soil or sand and also hydrate. And uh, flat stones are great for butterflies and other pollinators to rest upon and uh, warm themselves in the sun. Uh, fruit's also really great to provide if you have some, um, some watermelon or uh, like a lot of citrus, if you put that out. Um, in your in your landscape, um, you'll attract some birds and butterflies um, to your yard, which is really fun to watch. Um, maybe add a little gnome to your landscape, um, but also bee hotels are really neat, and you can, you can simply make these by um, using some logs um, and drilling holes into the logs, uh, using cut pieces of bamboo um, or other hollow stems, um, and then facing chicken wire and box, and you can create a little bee hotel. Um, and a lot of those bees are um, made of solitary bees, and they, that they tend not to sting people, and they don't really disturb people. So um, unlike honeybees, um, they won't sting. All right, so we also want to minimize pesticide use. Um, by using integrated pest management. Um, like I mentioned before, you really want to observe and monitor your garden you know, almost every day so that you're seeing the change if there's any change, you're noticing um, if there's any disease or pest issues in your garden because you could walk out and, and see, you know, you start to see an infestation of insects, say, and you wanna make sure that you catch that early. Um, you wanna understand uh, thresholds. Um, so the threshold being allowing for um, some insects or disease to occur in your garden. No garden is going to be perfect, um, so you're always going to have some sort of pest or disease pressure. But um, knowing knowing when um, when to when to um, address the problem is really important. Um, also, using methods like prevention, so proper spacing with plants uh, and pruning. And, um, and irrigation, so instead of watering the plant um, on top and the leaves, we always want to water our plants from the roots uh, at the soil where the plants are going to uptake that water. Um, and then also, uh, we want to correctly identify the issues. Like I said, um, if I would have known that was a volatile caterpillar, I would not have sprayed um, the BT on it. So, so knowing what your pest is, knowing what the issue is, um, will help you determine uh, what control measures that you need to take. Um, so when we're controlling um, the issue, if it's bad enough, um, we want to try to figure out the least possible, um, uh, the, uh, I guess the least intense um, uh, way to do it first. So um, say you have aphids on your plant, um, if you want to start off by spraying your plant, with, um, with water first, a heavy stream of water. That way it helps get some of those aphids off. Um, if you see them coming back, then you take the next step up. So starting off with a, um, with a, with a smaller step first and then moving up um, is 
is really beneficial to your other pollinator insects. Um, using your broad spectrum pesticides is kind of a last resort. Things like seven and other other pesticides that are going to kill a wider range, a wide array array of um, of different insects. Um, it's going to be your last resort because you do want to keep those um, those beneficial populations um, high so that you're um, so you're not allowing them to become out of out of balance. Um, and when you're spraying for pesticides, always always follow the label uh, and follow the direction. Um, the label on the pesticide container is the law, so you have to follow it. And um, your protective gear is very important. So um, making sure that you're taking these steps if you do decide to spray in your garden, um, and that will minimize the impact of pesticides on you and your landscape. Um, and just to review, um, if you're interested in um, having your landscape become a certified wildlife um, habitat, these are some of the things that you will need um, in order to survive. So, like we said, food, um, your native plants that provide nectar, seeds, nuts, fruits, berries, foliage, pollen, and, um, and insects eaten by uh, a variety of wildlife. Um, you want to create a water source. Um, all animals need water to survive, and they also need bathing and breathing. breathing. Um, also, some sort of uh, cover or shelter, like we we're talking about with the brush pile or the logs, um, to shelter from bad weather or places to hide from predators. Also, places to raise young. So, wildlife needs resources to reproduce and to keep their species going. And uh, we also want to practice uh, sustainable practices. So, garden management, um, you know, anything that you spray or anything that you do can have an effect on the health of soil, your air, water, and general habitat of wildlife. Um, and I just want to share with you guys some resources. Um, I really like this Jersey Friendly Yards website. Um, you can go in and uh, select a region, kind of wherever you live in, in the state. Um, you can select uh, different plant types. You can select for just native plants. Um, you can select what type of wildlife. Um, the plants will attract, whether it's deer resistant um, and things like that. So I really like that Jersey Friendly Yard site. Um, also, um, the National Wildlife Federation has a native plant finder, and you can type in your zip code and either find um, native plants, and they'll tell you um, which uh, pollinators that plant is attracted to. Um, you can also find specific butterflies, and then you can also save your list, which is really nice so that you know, when you go to, um, to order plants or you go to your nurseries, um, you can bring that list with you and say, hey, I want this plant, this plant, and um, add that to your garden. Um, here's a new one that I just learned about. It's a Rutgers resource uh, called Protecting Bees, and you can find your uh, pollinator attractive plants. And I was playing on this site a little bit earlier today, and it's really great because you can go in and um, similar to the other sites, but a little more specific, you can find um, specific plants, or you can go in and find plants that specific pollinators um, are attracted to. So if you're looking to attract um, a type of fly or something like that to your garden, you can go in, select that, that insect, and it'll give you a list of different plants that it will be attracted to. Um, some other Rutgers resources, uh, we have two really good fact sheets. Uh, one is incorporating native plants in your residential landscape. Another one is supporting bees in your garden and farm. And um, the Winfrey Lab at Rutgers has an awesome website with really, really cool pictures um, about uh, all sorts of native bees. And, um, and these photos are amazing. So if you have the time, definitely visit this, um, this website, Winfrey Lab. Just type in uh, Winfrey Rat Lab Rutgers, and um, it should pop up. And um, I really, I, I need to go back and look at that website because it's really amazing. They take some awesome pictures. Um, and then just another plug for Michelle's presentation on Monday, um, the Earth Day at Home, uh, Monday the 1st. She's going to have a plant this, not that presentation. 
So trying to avoid invasives in your yard and um, talking about all the different ornamental plants that are invasive and that you know, destroy wildlife habitats. And um, I'm going to be helping her facilitate that on, on Monday. So if you have any questions, that's a really good time. Uh, questions about invasives, that's another good time to learn about invasive plants. And um, what else? Yeah. Thank you guys for listening. Uh, any more questions? Thank you, Angela. That was great. Appreciate that. Um, yeah, there are a few questions here. Uh, one was, um, are ink berry hollies dioecious? And um, tackle that? Yes, they are. Um, like most hollies, um, they need uh, both male and female right. in order to pollinate and get the fruit. And then somebody was asking about companion planting for uh, pest control. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, if we go back a couple slides. Um, oh, there it is. Um, if you if you grow some of these um, some of the plants in like the carrot family, you know, like a lot of your you know your dills and parsley and things like that, um, when it like the dill especially as it blooms, um, those uh, floral nectaries are really great um, for different insects to sit upon, and uh, those will attract those beneficial insects. Um, a lot of your herbs will attract the beneficial insects as well, and um, you know, a lot of your asters and things like that. So um, if you have a vegetable garden, um, you, wanna, you want to um, grow some of your native plants for beneficials kind of close by so that the, um, the beneficial insects will kind of migrate over to your vegetable garden and kind of, you know, start, uh, start attacking those uh, vegetable pests. Also, someone asked about the, do we have a top 10 list for pollinators? Um, Actually, uh, George Hamilton did work with us some years ago uh, from Rutgers. He's an entomologist at Rutgers, and we do have a list that we could post on our website that uh, we could make available. The links that, that Dave Smella gives you, make sure you uh, visit our county link uh, because we'll post that next week for you on that. Um, Hello? Yes, go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, um, there are a few questions on plants. Uh, like, is phlox a good plant, and what kind of um, uh, milkweed species would be beneficial for insects? Uh, yeah, phlox is good. Um, and there's, you know, there's kind of two types of phlox. There's phlox for shade, and then phlox for sun. If you visit that um, that Mount Cuba Center website, they do have a list of nativars that they've tested, and um, and you can you can view uh, which flocks uh, varieties were best for um, for pollinators, and then different types of milkweed. Rich, was that was the other question? Yeah, yeah. Um, so, so it really does depend on your soil type. Um, so your swamp milkweed is going to like. Um, more wet soils and they can tolerate a little more clay soils, whereas your common milkweed um, will like a little dry to medium soil and then your butterfly weed can tolerate um, some drought. And the, and the common milkweed can um, tolerate sandy soils, sandy dry soils too. So um, it does depend. And then um, I would recommend um, the book by Heather Holm. It's called Pollinators of Native Plants and um, we'll put that with the resources. Um, I love this book. And and it goes through um, all the different types of native plants and which insects they attract. And, um, and it goes by um, different types of landscapes, like, um, like your open prairies, your woodlands, um, your wetlands. And, um, and I think that's a, that would be a great book if you're looking for a specific plants for different pollinators. Angela, could you mention the title and author one more time? Thanks. Sure. Um, it's Heather Holm, H-O-L-M. And it's called Pollinators of Native Plants. And there's a couple of quickies here um, yeah. maybe you can answer. Mm -hmm. One is, um, should the water source be, for insects be away from bird feeders, bird baths? Yeah. You can, answer, I guess, answer that one, and I have another short one. Yeah, um, yeah, because uh, some, of, some of those water sources are going to attract birds. Um, yeah, if they're, 
So yeah, so yes, you want them you want them to be farther away from the um bird, uh, bird bat. Um because birds do eat butterflies. Um so kind of having them a little bit farther away, maybe in a um, sunny location, but maybe kind of secluded, um, kind of hiding it from the birds, that would probably be best. And then the, the, so talking about the bee hotel and the wire that's over that, is it necessary to have a wire over those bee hotels? Um, not necessarily, but it just helps prevent um, other animals getting into it, like snakes and things like that. So um, the, it's, it's not really necessary. I mean, I know Gardens Alive or one of those websites sell um, hanging bee hotels. Um, but I think it just kind of keeps out some of those um, larger birds and, and other predators out of the bee hotel. Okay. So uh, there were there were some other questions, but um, if you guys, um, we will try to get to these questions. Uh, if you can contact the one site that we put up with our master gardeners, because there's there's so many questions that we can't get to them all right now. Um, but I would um, recommend that you contact us at the one site that we gave in the beginning. The tick controls out there have a, a negative impact on pollinators. Some of the um, softer materials that are out there would have less of an impact on them, um, but I, I have not read anything where there's a direct impact. So that one uh, we'll have to look into a little bit more. But. Um, the, some some of the, the, the stronger compounds, I, I do recommend that people, even using those on, on people or children, to uh, read the label. Be careful to make sure that if you're using a, a ton of, of any kind, make sure that um, you're not sensitive to it. So uh, using a smaller uh, dose compound and really testing it out is, is, is really to your benefit to make sure that you don't have an adverse reaction to it. Uh, and there are ways that you can um, kind of identify whether you have ticks or not by using a drag where you use um, a, you can drag it in areas where you think you might have ticks and you can identify the ticks from that and you really do, do need people for ticks um, on a regular basis. But some of the compounds that are used for tick control, um, you know, like uh, uh, carbaryl that was used in the past in certain formulations could be harmful to beneficial insects, absolutely. So you gotta be careful with those compounds. If you look on Google and look for native nurseries near you, you should come up with a listing of people that carry many of the native plants that we've uh, recommended here. And then some excellent resources that she'll have listed um, as part of this presentation that we'll have up on the website. Yeah, um, the Na uh, New Jersey Native Plant Society has a whole list of native uh, nurseries in the area, and I'm just going to put that in the... Yeah, so yeah, that's that's a great resource with the New Jersey Native Plant Society, so I would highly recommend going there. Um, also, um, right now is a good time to visit your local farms, because uh, many of them, we've been picking asparagus and strawberries and greens and... Um, Farms are all following a very strict protocol right now, but it, it's a good way to get your from your local farm. So on our website, we have a listing, a statewide listing that you can go to for local farm, um, and also um, one specifically for uh, Middlesex County. And um, But the state listing will, no matter where you are, you can put the county, and it will give you a listing on uh, Visit New Jersey Farms. Um, find all that information when you go to our Middlesex County Grows uh, website. Also want to thank our freeholders that are very supportive uh, in each county of our New Jersey Ag Experiment Station. We wouldn't be here without the mutual support from our federal and state partners and our, especially our county partners. Um, so thank you very much for all of your support. And Angela, thank you so much for uh, all your great information today. We really appreciate it. We hope to see everybody back here have a great week and stay healthy, and we hope to see you next week.